Good afternoon. It is my pleasure today to welcome you to the Words of Wisdom WOW Speaker Series. Three months ago, several other students and I had the idea of starting a speaker series at the high school that would feature a monthly speaker from the school district of Clayton faculty. It was a unique opportunity, it would be a unique opportunity for faculty members to share a life story, for teachers to step outside of their discipline in the academic curriculum, and for students to hear their words of wisdom. Since then, with the support of Dr. Bosses, principal of Clayton High School, and Dr. Wilkinson, interim superintendent of the school district of Clayton, this idea has come to fruition with the creation of the WAF Speaker Series. Today, we are thrilled to have Ms. Donna Rogers here as our inaugural WOW speaker. Ms. Rogers Beard has been a history teacher for over 40 years. She's been teaching at CHS for now 21 years, and she shows no sign of stopping anytime soon. <laughs> she believes that the lessons learned in history can help us make this a better world. At this time, I ask that you turn off all cellular devices, and without further ado, it is my honor to introduce Ms. Donna Rogers Beard. better humans. 
And now we have in Steven Pinker's well-documented book evidence that the human story is on a trajectory to reduce violence. This does not mean that violence will be removed from our lives, that there will be no poverty. Utopian societies don't exist, but it means that we can reduce violence significantly if we're willing to continue what Dr. Pinker tells us has caused a reduction in violence. The central thesis of Better Angels is that our era is less violent, less cruel, and more peaceful than any previous period of human existence. The decline for violence holds for violence in the family, in neighborhoods, between tribes, and between states. People living now are less likely to meet with violence, with a violent death, or to suffer from violence or cruelty at the hands of others than people living in any previous century. Dr. Pinker says that from the pre-state or state of nature period, the average human had about a 15% chance of dying of violence, and today that has decreased to 3%. That's significant. But it's taken about 5,000 years. <laughs> and much of it, of it, however, has happened in the last 250 years. Dr. Pinker asked us to be optimistic. He asked us to see our world of the last 65 years as one blessed by unprecedented levels of peaceful coexistence. He says he wrote 800 pages, including many data sets, graphs, and explanation of the numbers, to try and convince people who believe that this is an increasingly violent world, that it is not. That we see ourselves in an increasingly hostile, violent world because the media is bringing us bad news 24-7 from around the world. And we know that if it bleeds, it leads. I believe that studying and discussing, and most of all, applying Stephen Pinker's work will help us further reduce violence and poverty in our world. My wisdom to you is read this book. If you can't read the entire book, at least go to the EDGE website where you can watch and read his hour-long speech summarizing the book. I would like to make this work for you one of the most important books of the 21st century. Then I ask you to look carefully at the world you know, the culture here at Clayton High School. Think about a physical altercation you have witnessed. How many of you said to yourself, how could this happen? How could two or more people lose such control of themselves and not think of the consequence of their behavior? How could someone give into such raw, negative emotion and do something so damaging to their future and embarrass him or herself in this way? Then think of why you would not do it. Why? First of all, you've probably not gotten that angry with someone. Nor have most of you witnessed or been at the receiving end of someone that angry. Is this what Peter is saying when he says, everything in human affairs is connected to everything else? And that is especially true for violence. Across time and space, the more peaceable societies also tend to be richer, healthier, better educated, better governed, more respectful to their women, and more likely to engage in trade. I often tell my students that I have limited power to keep them seated in the classroom, listening and discussing the topic at hand. They do so because we have a mutual respect for each other and what is going on in that classroom. They came to learn, and I came to teach. 
As Pinker says of societies that cooperate and are peaceable with each other, as most of our students are, it is because they do not want to endanger commerce and their profit. So what could the students profit? Grades. <laughs> the reputation you establish so that teachers will write those glowing testaments about your character and those college recommendations. Pinker says that the growth of the state has helped to reduce crime also. Pinker argues that at least part of the reason for regional differences in American homicide rates is that people in some regions of the country are less likely to accept the state's monopoly on force. Quoting from the New York Times review, he goes on to say, instead, in some regions, there's a tradition of self-help justice and a culture of honor. And these regions sanction retaliation when one is insulted or mistreated. Most of our students accept the school's monopoly on force. Most of you will come to an adult for help because you've been taught and it's been confirmed that adults care about you. And you respect and accept that adults here at CHS have the monopoly on force. They will take care of the problem. Retaliation for an insult that usually does not override risking one's status at school or at home or in the community. You cooperate at school because you are stakeholders in your education. You have something invested and expect to have high returns for your participation. I think Pinker is saying that one reason for the decline in violence that more people today are stakeholders. It is the importance of the middle class, the vast majority who have a vested interest in an orderly society. He says the spread of commerce creates incentives for poor cooperation and against violent conflict. In addition to the spread of commerce, Dr. Pinker gives some credit to the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th century, in which people began to question forms of violence that had been before acceptable human behavior. Slavery, torture, despotism, dueling, and extreme forms of punishment. Voices even began to raise against cruelty to animals. Pinker refers to this as the humanitarian revolution, where people are constantly becoming nicer to each other, consciously becoming nicer to each other, where people are consciously promoting social equality. This is a revolution that you are part of. You come from a school district and a community that has led, in many respects, the humanitarian revolution. I urge you to learn about the former superintendents, Earl Hobbs and Don Cindy's role in putting Clayton at the forefront of the voluntary <coughs> desegregation plan. And don't allow to be forgotten that a few years ago, Clayton students challenged the community with a well-orchestrated walkout in support of the desegregation plan when there were those in the community who questioned its work. Many in Clayton celebrate the value of broadening educational opportunity and value diversity. Celebrate and go spread the word of our long-established Grace Gay Straight Alliance organization. Stephen Pinker's research says that the historical trajectory of tolerance and inclusion is working. Tell those who derive the wisdom of political correctness that tolerance, kindness, empathy is making this a safer world. There are individuals who long for and would like to take us back to the good old days. I hope you can use your social studies education to ask those folks point blank, who's good old days? Pinker says the gay rights movement has seen
seen an increase in the number of states in the world, and American states, that decriminalized homosexuality. It used to be a felony. Anti-gay attitudes are in steady decline, such as whether homosexuality is morally wrong, whether it should be made illegal, or whether gay people should be denied equal opportunities. Hate crimes of intimidation against gays have been in decline since they were first measured. Dr. Pinker credits education with increased tolerance and decreased violence against the most vulnerable in our society. And understand that what you have here at Clayton High School is, an, is access to an excellent education. And you're surrounded by people who care about you and treat you with respect. What Dinker, uh, Dr. Pinker calls the pacifying forces of, of literacy, education, and the intensity of public discourse. It increases people's tolerance, encourages them to think more abstractly and more universally. And that will inevitably push us in the direction, in the reduction of violence. So does this mean that all people will have to have at least an undergraduate degree and everything will be okay? Dr. Pinker says no. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. It sounds elitist to say this, but attitudes towards women, homosexuals, and racial minorities, and the tolerant attitudes we celebrate of not beating up your kids tend to start among the most educated strata and you can see the rest of the country dragging behind. Again, here in our community, our PTO joined the effort to stamp out bullying by bringing at great expense the Shakespeare Festival play, Cruel to Be Kind, which set the issue of bullying in the late 16th century. Our entire staff goes through annual sensitivity training concerning sexual harassment and bullying. Events over the last week brought to the forefront that even the most mighty can be brought down by not seriously taking uh, sexual misconduct against our youth seriously. It's not getting worse out there. People are caring, and it's working to make us all safer. Pinker also credits the internet and social media for furthering what he calls the humanitarian revolution, which was preceded by the Republic of the Letters. We have certainly witnessed this as young people have been caught and exposed on YouTube attacking other young people. And imagine the lesson learned when a Texas judge is exposed by his daughter who videotaped him beating her with a scrap when she was 16 years old, and now six years later has released it as a YouTube on YouTube. These are just examples of a few ways in which the internet is helping to continue the discourse that says schoolyard bullying and domestic violence are not going to be business as usual in our society. Our police officers are being held accountable for unnecessary use of force through their, through their own police vehicles installing cameras and through people videotaping undue force. Many of these incidents have gone viral on YouTube. Dr. Pinker also credits, along with the increase in the internet and international trade, since World War II, the continuous increase and the number of intergovernmental organizations that countries have entered. I give you as an example the United Nations UNICEF program, which is a global program to reduce violence. Work is being done in psychiatry, pediatrics, and education that document the impact of violence on children and what happens to their brain development even when they witness violence. The United Nations program is using those studies to reduce violence on a global level. 
maybe your career choice will not be plastics, but the furthering of the reduction of violence through public policy backed by scientific research done by others of your generation. Dr. Pinker goes on to say that the invention of printing and the development of a cosmopolitan republic of letters in the 17th and 18th centuries helped spread ideas that led to the humanitarian revolution. This was pushed further in the 19th century by popular novels like Uncle Tom's Cabin and Oliver Twist, that by encouraging readers to put themselves in the position of someone very different from themselves, we have expanded the sphere of our moral concern. This trend can, continues in fiction and nonfiction. You may one day write a book that allows us to walk in someone else's shoes and expand our sphere of moral concern. In 2010, Rebecca Slott, a freelance science writer, exposed the violent world of poverty lived by a poor woman and her family. This book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, is about the research that led to one of the most important health breakthroughs of the 20th century, the HeLa cells, and the search for the real white flesh and blood woman whose death by cancer at John Hopkins Research Hospital provided the HeLa cells. Through Mrs. Slott's work, we are able to immerse ourselves in a world of unbelievable rural and urban poverty. Henrietta's children and grandchildren are caught up in a world of crime and violence. Rebecca Slott challenged her fears and entered their world to do her story. She had to work hard to gain their confidence. In the end, she is able to educate a vast public and make a difference in the lives of the heirs of Henrietta Lacks, the heirs who inherited her generational poverty and world of violence, now have been given an opportunity to gain some control over their lives by understanding and being proud of what happened to their mother's cells. Rebecca Slough has set up an educational fund for Henrietta Lacks' grandchildren and great-grandchildren and people now around the world have been exposed to this story and would have been lost had it not been for her. The book has been on the New York Times nonfiction bestsellers list for now two years. You may be the next Harriet Beecher Stowe, the next Rebecca Scott, or the reporter with the next expose about man's inhumanity to man that will continue to move us in the positive trajectory documented by Dr. Pinker. That says, contrary to conventional belief, we are reducing violence. Another popular nonfiction work that allows us to gain insight into the world of people who are very important to our world, we nickeled and dimed on Not Getting By in America by Barbara Ehrenreich. She looks at the people who clean our hotel rooms, our homes, our nursing homes, and our hospitals. The people who prepare and serve our food, take care of our elderly and our children. My students know that I say that the work of the best surgeon in the world can be undone by an unsanitary operating room or hospital but there are those who don't understand the importance of those who do the so-called menial work in our society. Herman Cain said, anyone who's not rich has only him or herself to blame. We can't have all rich people in our society and survive. We need to redefine what is necessary for a rich, successful, happy society. We need the people who do the work that allows us to sleep in a strange town, in a clean room, and not bring home bed bugs. We need the people who pick the fruits and vegetables. But history has taught us that we've come a long way from caste systems 
that made people who did these jobs the unclean ones, to be set aside from the community, the untouchables. We've even come a long way from the New Deal in the 30s, when the New Deal covered most workers with Social Security and unemployment, but not farm and domestic workers. Hopefully, you will see the wisdom of working to see that people we rely on day to day day-to-day -day basis have a greater quality of life. So they and their children are greater stakeholders in our society. Yours will not be an easy task. There are those who are working hard to halt and even do, undo the progress we have made historically in what Stephen Pinker calls the humanitarian revolution. They want to pull out of the United Nations and put a for sale sign on the United Nations building. They want to stall or even overturn the progressive movement against discrimination based on sexual orientation. They want to stop many education programs and shutter the Department of Ed. My words of wisdom to you, understand that we are at a tipping point, a crossroad road. The good news is that we're becoming better as a human race. And hopefully, we have a better understanding why we're getting better. However, we cannot become complacent because we have a long way to go to reduce violence even 1% more. I ask you to consider the task at hand, America's report card. We're number one in incarcerating our population. The United States is the world's leading jailer. Of the industrialized countries, only the United States, Japan, and China still have capital punishment. Two thirds of our states have capital punishment. Missouri is one of them. Missouri is one of the 21 American states that allow corporal punishment in our schools. Most of Europe has banned corporal punishment and even considers it a domestic violence issue. We are 36 in life expectancy in the world. We are 34 in infant mortality rates. If education is the key factor in reducing violence, we need to work hard to reduce the dropout rate in our country and in our state. It is down from 1960, when the consistent national statistics first were being kept. In 1960s, it was 27.2 dropout rate. Today, we're getting better. It's 8.1. But for St. Louis City, it's 25%. In the global comparison, the United States is 17 in the world among high school graduates. If we want to continue to live in a continuing, safer world, these statistics have to improve. Stephen Pinker says, I argue that despite impressions for long-term trend, though certainly halting and incomplete, is that violence of all kinds is decreasing. This calls for a rehabilitation of a concept of modernity and progress and for a sense of gratitude for the institutions, civilizations, and enlightenment that have made it possible. Confucius said in the 5th century BCE, wisdom, courage, and compassion are the three universally recognized moral qualities of men. To seize this trajectory of reducing violence and not allowing it to slip back into the dark ages, you, generation Y, are going to have to become one of the great generations. You're going to have to have the courage and persistence of the Atlantic explorers, the wisdom of the American fighters for independence, and the compassion and courage of the abolitionists and the civil rights workers. They were not a majority of the population but they were special people who saw what could be done and did it. Again, there's so much to be done, but education seems to be the key component 
in keeping the human narrative on a trajectory that allows us to move towards a less violent future. There are those who say throwing more money at education is not the solution, but we're fooling ourselves if we do not realize that it's going to take resources that cost money to make a significant difference to keep our dropout rate going lower and lower. We know that the major development of the human mind is from birth to five years old. Where are most American children during this time? In quality education? Six to 13 seems to be the most efficient time to learn a new language. How many public, private, or charter schools offer second language in elementary school. We know the impact of music lessons on academic achievement. Become familiar with the various studies done between the 1970s and today on the impact of music education on academic achievement. There's a significant correlation. But there are those who want us to cut the amount of money communities spend on education. And often the cuts come first in the arts. So why should we as a society provide for other people's children this level of education? Maybe it's because Pinker's study informs us that there is a strong connection between the number of people being educated and this becoming a less violent world. My concluding words of wisdom Learn from history, learn from the past, become more familiar with Dr. Pinker's research, and combine it with your lessons from history, and continue to carry us on this trajectory towards greater peace.